This is a Maisie Media production. When Asia came to me, her biggest challenge was that she wanted clear strategy for moving forward with her new brand. After her Pick My Brain session, she was asked, during your session, did you gain any insights or knowledge or tools that you didn't have before? Asia's response was, yes. The session with Ayana was very helpful. She pushed me with her questions and also was encouraging and clear with her guidance. It made me feel empowered and my goals seem much more achievable. If you're on the fence about whether you should book your Pick My Brain session or not, I suggest that you do a little research, identify what your core issue, problem, or topic is that you want to discuss, identify whether you think that I could be the person to help you or not, and if you decide that I'm the person that can help you, head over to switchpivotorquit.com and book your session. Hey girl, hey, and thanks for dropping into the Switch Pivot or Quit podcast. Candid convo for the girl needing a lifestyle plot twist when she's deciding if it's time to switch, pivot, or quit. I'm Ayana Angel and I am your host as well as chief encourager and author. In order for you to hang out with us in this awesome space, all that's required for you to do is sit back, open your mind, and enjoy the show. On today's show, we're chatting with Elaine Welteroth, an award-winning journalist, New York Times bestselling author, and judge on the new Project Runway. She was most recently editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, where in 2017, she became the youngest person ever appointed editor-in-chief. And in 2012, she was the first African-American to ever hold the post of Beauty and Health director at a Condé Nast publication. Prior to Team Vogue, Elaine was the senior beauty editor at Glamour and the beauty and style editor at Ebony. She's now a leading expert and advocate for the next generation of change makers. She has written for the hit show Grownish and has appeared on camera for a range of media outlets, including ABC News and Netflix. Some may know her for her signature big curly hair and others for her retro specs that we love so much, but now we will know her as New York Times bestselling author because her new book, More Than Enough, Claiming Space for Who You Are, No Matter What They Say, is out now and it has reached the top of the charts, honey. So we're definitely excited for Elaine and proud of her. And we're going to chat all about the book and so much more. So get ready for this awesome conversation. P.S. Elaine is actually a friend of a friend to the show by the name of Brooke, and we want to send a huge warm hug and thank you to Brooke for actually being the facilitator to make this conversation happen. This is an example of true women's empowerment and true women supporting women. So thank you so much, Brooke. We appreciate you. Elaine, welcome to the show. So excited to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to, to be on. Yes, absolutely. So let's get started with diving into your early years. What was your very first paying job and what were you doing? Ooh, good question. <laughs> I had, let's see, I think I was uh, at Hometown Buffet, oh. the, the local buffet that was across from the mall and across from my high school. And I was the dancing bird. I got <laughs> to wear that mascot costume and I would basically dance next to the hostess area and um, just have the time of my life. And <laughs> when I wasn't in that costume, I was, I was a waitress um, and this was in high school, but I had a, I had a few jobs. I've been working since I was, been, since the minute I could get my workers permit. So I also worked at, this is not glamorous. Um, I worked at the Metro PCS kiosk oh, cool. at the yes. mall. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I also worked at the mall in this other job where I, I was, it was called Cunningham Research. And I was the girl, that annoying person who stands in the middle of like the, the mall courtyard with, um, a uh, or something. It, yeah. It's asking you if you want to take surveys. Um, can I have so a minute of your time? I got to flex <laughs> my interview skills early. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I bet that was a great way to deal with uh, any potential rejection too, because I'm sure that you get a lot of rejection and that's if people are like, I'm too busy. I don't have time. Yeah. It totally. Totally. Yeah. Gave me some thick skin and it, exactly. it allowed me to, to, to hone my interview skills. 
Absolutely. So let take us through a little bit. Um, I guess you could say because people can easily Google you and figure it out. But just for those listening who may not be aware, take us through a little bit of your switch, pivot or quit experience, because that's what we talk about a lot here. So maybe from where you knew that Team Vogue was this dream job for you and uh, being the editor in chief and then things were going to transition in your life. What did that time sort of look like and how did we get to where we are now? Mm. Well, it's definitely all in the book and mm-hmm. um, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but um, <laughs> you know, I feel like one of the main takeaways from my book is just this idea that your life is a series of dreams realized and we mm-hmm. do not have to be defined by one title, one career path, one relationship. Um, I think we should give ourselves permission to accomplish a dream and then go after another. And, mm. and especially right now, this is, it's, a, it's a new era where many of us will have multiple careers. And um, I think the important thing is to find your purpose mm. and, um, and to remember that your purpose is multi-platform. You know, job titles are, are temporary, but purpose is everlasting. And I think um, the, the, the mission that I walked into Teen Vogue with is the same mission that I carried with me out of Teen Vogue and into every project that I take on, whether it's in, in, you know, TV, um, Mm -hmm. in my new book, um, and beyond. So, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, I never grew growing up, um, you know, I didn't see myself reflected in the pages of magazines as a, as a kid. And I, and I knew firsthand, sort of the detrimental effect that can have on your Mm self-esteem. And so when I found myself sitting in, you know, having having a proverbial seat at the table, I really approached that with a sense of purpose to change, to change that for the next generation of young girls of color and, um, and anyone who ever has ever felt marginalized in mainstream media. And Mm -hmm. I feel really proud of what we've been able to do, what we were able to do together collectively as a team at Teen Vogue, um, not only in terms of diversity and inclusion, but in terms of, you know, creating a a valid, um, respected intersection where you could, where all aspects of a young person's identity could be celebrated. You know, mm-hmm. I think we've too, for too long been told that um, you can only be one thing. And like, you know, there's these false binaries have been reinforced that mm-hmm. make us feel like you can either be, you know, into fashion or into politics as if these things are mutually exclusive and they're not. So to be a part of a platform that um, that gave voice to the next generation who very much, uh, you know, are multifaceted humans and they care mm-hmm. about fashion. They also care about um, the, the political issues that are affecting our world um, was really just a joy and a, and a triumph and something I'm really proud of. Mm-hmm. And um, I always knew ever since I was 21 and I entered the, the magazine business, I always knew that that would just be like sort of my first step. And and um, there would be more. I knew I would come to a point where I needed to take a leap of make a leap of faith, mm-hmm. and um, I just didn't expect it to happen so soon. I didn't expect <laughs> it for me to kind of get my dream job and and be able to check off my bucket list in in magazine journalism by thirty. But um, yeah. certainly, when I looked up and realized that I had, I I, I couldn't ignore or deny that call um, for more. So yeah. I had to be brave enough to 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 make that leap, and I haven't I haven't looked back. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. So your new book, as you mentioned, more than enough is out now for the world to consume. What was that writing process like for you? It was grueling. It's hard writing a book and <laughs> right. it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard to do it in a year. Mm-hmm. It's hard to do it in a year when you're doing a lot of other things. Um, you know, I, I was on a TV show. I had lots of other pro- side projects. I did a lot of speaking and right. um, I felt this sort of pressure to establish myself post Teen Vogue. So Um, but at the same time, I had to say no to a lot of things in order to carve Mm. out space and time to build my own table, which Mm -hmm. is what is, which is how I see this book. Um, Mm -hmm. it's my first table. It's my offering to, um, you know, the community of women that I want to be in conversation with. So, Mm. um, yeah, it it was, it was not easy, but I'm so proud of it. Um, I'm, it's sort of a surreal moment to, to know that last year at this time, I didn't have a sentence written and now <laughs> it's a full it's a whole book it's a right. whole book and a, a hefty book in the world <laughs> yeah yes yeah. and it's right that was that was funny to me when I saw the book I was like oh this is like 
this is a dense book. This, yeah. is, a, this is a book book. Yeah. You know, it's like 300, it's more than 300 pages. It's hefty, but I think once you, once you crack it open, hopefully this has been your experience, but you know, I've heard from people and I've had even the experience myself. It, it, you breeze through it. You really, yeah. it's sort of, it's, it, it's a, it's a, you can get through it. You it, it it's sort of a book that's just a page turner. Yeah. So hopefully people don't get, uh, too intimidated by how, how, how thick it is. Yeah, no, I would agree with that because I think it's more so your storytelling ability and it just, and you sort of the way that you're presenting things, it's almost in like small, small chunks. So you're still creating the full story, but we're getting the pieces that we need to keep moving us along through the story. So I definitely appreciate that. I I definitely think it's a page turner and a a easy read in the sense that it's going to keep your attention. Is there anything that you learned from your magazine days uh, that you've been able to use and transfer into the work that you're doing now? Everything. Yeah, Mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, no, no, no. As an editor in chief, I don't know if people realize just how many hats you have to wear. Um, But they you probably know, don't. So tell us. Yeah, about- <laughs> no, it's like being a, it's like being a CEO. It's like being a, you know, it's a, it's a, you have to be a brand builder, builder. You have to be a storyteller. You have to be uh, an excellent writer and editor. You have to be an excellent manager of creative, mm. not an easy thing. You have to have a, a you know, have to, you have to have vision. You have to have, you have to have an eye for detail and for, um, and taste a certain taste level. Um, you know, you're part of, you know, building uh, visual creative teams and executing on shoot concepts, and um, it's it. So it, it's a it's a it's a lot of dreams combined, I, and that's really what attracted me to this industry and to this particular role. Um, and you also have to be a salesperson, by the way. You have to mm. know how to pitch and sell big ideas in order to keep the business afloat, to keep the lights on, especially mm. in a in a in a struggling economy where magazines are folding left and right, and particularly teen titles. Um, and I also even started in the business um, at an under-resourced magazine that I'm actually really proud of. And it doesn't really get enough shine when, when you know, I, Ebony Magazine is where I got my start. And yeah. um, I wouldn't have ever climbed the ranks of, of you know, media in Condé Nast had it not been for my scrappy beginnings at Ebony Magazine, where I had to wear a lot of different hats. Um, and so everything I learned um, as a storyteller, as a truth teller, um, as an advocate for the outside voice, um, I, I learned that from my foundation in magazine journalism. Mm-hmm. And more than enough, you said that before I could go from assimilator to disruptor, I had to find my voice and build my tribe. How did you go about finding your voice and building your tribe? Because there's a lot of people, women that are listening, where I'm sure they're in that transition space and they're maybe going into a new um new territory in their life and they're trying to figure out who do I need to be around? What type of people do I need to build up around me so that I can be successful in this new space in my life? Mm -hmm. I mean, it happens day by day, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it does not happen overnight. And I think that's the important thing to remember. We have to be compassionate with ourselves and have patience with ourselves and the process. And that's kind of why I wrote the book, because I think you can see you know, that it's really a series of, of steps that you take. You put one foot in front of the other and, um, and sometimes you get knocked down and you got to get back up and you got to find your, your sisterhood. And, um, and I feel grateful that I certainly have found my tribe of women in different industries, um, who've, who've definitely been mentors to me along the way. Um, but I think, you know, the important thing is to, have a self-care practice and to have a network of women and people who see you and who see your value um, Mm -hmm. and who can be there to um, be sounding boards um, for your big ideas and and help you uh, work through, you know, those harder conversations of salary negotiations. Mm -hmm. I think we all, we need, we need a tribe outside the four walls that we work in um, to help us step into the, those uh, rooms and to feel empowered. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy, but it, but um, step by step, you know, meeting by meeting, idea by idea, mm-hmm. higher by higher. Um, that's how, that's how change happens. Mm-hmm. And um, it doesn't happen overnight. And it does certainly, you can't do anything transformative by yourself. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, you'll love what Maisie Media has in store for you at MaisieMedia.com. Maisie Media is a podcast network for women by women, and we're taking the dad 
and dude feeling out of podcasting. With Maisie Media, you can check out other great podcasts like Amelie. Amelie is eight episodes of no fluff, first person narratives highlighting women who collectively have more than 60 million in annual revenue. 2.2 2.2 million in social followers and have amassed more than 116 million in funding. You'll hear from women like Ali Webb, founder of Drybar, Mylee Teal, founder of Curlbox, and Ariel K, founder of Parachute Home, among so many others. From business to beauty, personal growth to society and culture, we're cultivating a listening environment that feels like a digital brunch date with your girls. Fun, fulfilling, and empowering. Visit MaisieMedia.com today. That's M-A-Y-Z-I-E Media.com. Can you think back to any personal development work or practices that maybe you started to implement in your life, which in turn positively affected your professional life? Um, yeah, being in a good relationship is mm-hmm. everything. I think mm-hmm. being with someone who is a true partner and who encourages you to shine brightly and who is there when you uh when the world kind of knocks you off your you know your a game and um i know having someone at the end of the day that um sees me truly and listens to me fully and is there for me no matter what um i think that is what helps me move through my life more boldly and you know someone um her name is edette noel sure if you don't know her you should be you should and you should follow her because she's such an inspiration but she's um, she, I call her my auntie Yvette. She's Beyonce's public, pub, longtime publicist, mm-hmm. um, and just an amazing, you know, black professional woman who's just been a real support system for me. She said to me, and was the best compliment, honestly, I've ever had. She was like, you know, Elaine. Um, she's like, what I, what I'm, you know, proud of about you is not just your accomplishments professionally, but she said, you know, you, you move through the world like someone who's loved. Mm. And, and that's, that's why you are able to, you know, take the risks that you take. Um, and that was, a, that meant a lot to me because it's a testimony, it's a testament to my parents and, you know, my partner and my, my, my network of friends and family. And I think, you know, when we can hold, hold each other and hold space for each other for the dark times, for the hard part of the stories mm-hmm. that never get told publicly, I think that is that's what makes us capable of doing kind of the revolutionary work that we need, we, we all need to do. Um, and so I just feel grateful for the, for the network that I have. And honestly, every boss I've ever had has been in one way or another, a mentor. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So a lot of people may see you now, you have this book out, you're everywhere. And they may be like, where did she come from? When you, when you knew that, okay, Team Vogue, things are changing Did you start to make a plan then as to the sort of what would be your career pivot and how you would position yourself? Or had you already sort of started thinking, okay, I'm, this is, this is going to go to, but so far, and I'm going to do X, Y, Z next. So I'm going to start positioning myself on the back end so that I'll be prepared for what that next phase is. Well, I always knew that magazines were going to be the first step and that I would, there would come a point where I would need to take a, a leap of faith. I, I came into the industry with that, with that kind of long game in mind. Okay. And um, the reason is because I, my, my role model, my career role model was a woman named Harriet Cole um, who did just that. She started her career in magazine journalism. Um, and after 11 years, she made the leap and started her own production company. Um, she, you know, did a lot of, impactful work in TV and um, she became a best-selling author, multiple Mm. books and Mm -hmm. um, just created this multifaceted career in media where she carved out a lane for herself. And I, that is what I was so inspired by. And I, I, I pursued her heavily until she (laughs) took a phone call from me and eventually she hired me as her intern and then assistant. And that's where I got my start at Ebony, Ebony Magazine, working under her. So she and and I also saw, unfortunately, um, her lose her job early on in my career, mm. um, and she was my hero. So it just showed me that you know, no matter how much value you bring, you are mm. dispensable. And I and I and and my goal from that day forward became, you know, my goal was to be indispensable. And um, 
and to take it as far as I possibly could. And then to, to take a leap and build, um, build my own kind of lane and and, in media for myself. And, and I'm just grateful that I've, you know, I think, I think we all have a, there's a divine order to the way that our lives unfold and our careers unfold, especially if we are obedient and, um, you know, listening for the call and, 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 and answering it. And, um, and, and if we don't let fear keep us small, I think, um, you know, we, our minds can be blown by, by, you know, what can happen in our careers. And I think the thing, the the way in which my mind was blown was just how fast all of it happened. You know, I definitely Mm -hmm. had this long game in mind, but I definitely didn't have this, um, timeline in mind. Um, and so, but I had to, when I looked up at 30 and realized, wow, I've been fighting for a seat at the table. Now I'm at the head of the table (laughs) and I did everything I came to do. And then some, And Mm -hmm. I have more to do out in the world and it's time to take this leap. And, you know, of course it was scary to walk away from a title that could have defined me. Um, But I I knew that there was more for me and I knew that I had done what I had accomplished, what I came to do. And, um, and, you know, I was grateful and, and, and I had the luxury of being able to, or the privilege rather of being able to kind of parallel path a career in, um, TV. I got to, I got to, uh, mm-hmm. sit in the writer's room for Grownish and I mm-hmm. did some work with, um, on Blackish while I was at Teen Vogue. And so, um, I wrote a script for Grownish. And so I was able to kind of, you know, explore this territory that was really calling me. And, um, and I had this book that was sort of writing itself inside of me. And, um, I was able to very quickly, you know, once I left Teen Vogue, I, I, um, was able to get that deal done, that book yeah. deal done. And I, and, and, um, just everything, everything that I set out to do kind of unfolded in an organic way, but it started with having a vision. And I think that's the most important thing for yeah. all of us to have is, is to have a long-term vision. And then also to be flexible to let to let life kind of take its course and sometimes sometimes things can end up happening that are better than you could have ever dreamed up for yourself but the important thing is to have a vision to have a plan and then to be flexible Mm -hmm. what would have been useful to know before embarking on this current career path or direction um i think that i i i learned the lessons when i needed to learn them and i i don't think that there's anything i can say that's like i i if I would have known this, I would have, you know, done things differently. You know, I, I think transitioning into being your own boss and and having to think about building your business as a CEO and, and paying people mm-hmm. and sharing, you know, your earnings with agents and, and lawyers and that kind of thing, it was <laughs> definitely a transition. But it's not something that it, you kind of have to go through it to learn it, you know? Yeah. And um, so I think that's where compassion for yourself comes in because you you know that you're not going to know everything Mm -hmm. and you don't let fear stop you. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's a lot of lessons that you pick up along the way. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I think in terms of leaving the path, um, with some signposts along the way, you know, I've been held up as a trailblazer in media and I'm like, well, don't call me a trailblazer unless I'm leaving signposts Mm -hmm. along the way that are going to make it easier and less daunting, less isolating for the next generation. Mm-hmm. or the next woman who's coming up behind me. So um, this book is all about that. It's all about leaving, you know, those those signposts and those tools that I've picked up and the lessons that I've learned. And listen, I have so much more to learn. I have so much more to do yeah. um, in this world. But there was an urgency around this message and these stories that I told in this book. So um, my hope is that women um, of all generations see themselves on these pages. And um, I hope that it's... Um, I hope it lights some torches. I hope it, it, it ignites people to chase their dreams. Mm-hmm. And um, I hope, I think at the end of it, I think people will put the book down and feel kind of triumphant and, and they'll be reminded of, you know, the power of what it, of, of a dream. So of your strengths, which ones have significantly helped you to get to where you are today? Relentlessness. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. I like that. What types of things do you do to actively expand your comfort zone? Mm. Or do you do anything? I don't know. Sometimes people are looking to expand their comfort zone, but sometimes people aren't, but I feel like you would be. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I, I don't let fears. I try not to let fear stop me. You know, I mm. think fear is a part of the process and sometimes it's about looking fear in the face and, and, and doing it anyway. And, mm. um, Every time I get on stage, every time I go to do new thing in a new territory, um, it is scary. 
but mm-hmm. um, I think the best things in life are on the other side of fear. Yeah. Yeah. Was there ever a time when you thought to yourself, I need to step it up? And if so, what did you then do? I'm someone who burns the candle at both ends. And, <laughs> and um, I'm always feeling like I'm, I want to outdo myself and I want to, you know, if there's more to do, I'm going to do it. And um, yeah, if anything, I needed to tell myself when to pump the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think I like, you know, like many women who are ambitious and their first generation success stories, you know, who don't have a fallback plan, who do not come from wealth um, or, you know, and, and who are their own security blankets. Um, I think if anything, for me, the lesson was um, knowing when to call it, as my mom would say, um, Mm -hmm. listening to my body, like resting, um, Mm -hmm. you know, knowing when to create some boundaries around work um, Mm -hmm. and, and when to prioritize joy. And, you know, someone told me, this is something that um, one of my, my author friends, Priya Parker, who just wrote a book called The Art of Gathering, which is fabulous, and you should definitely read it. Mm-hmm. Um, but she she told me when I, I was going out, I was going to take a, a writer's retreat. I was going on a writer's retreat um, and had a lot of work to do. And she was like, promise me that you are going to make joy buckets, make, make mm-hmm. buckets of joy. And I'm like, what does that mean? She's like, you know, you have to plan, you have to schedule joy sometimes. And mm. she's like, and if you don't, you won't ever claim space for joy in your life. So she said, you know, on your calendar, create um, appointments with joy and, and don't, and don't skip those, don't skip them. And, and so I went out to the Woodstock and I would wake up early in the morning, write all day. And then I created like a two or three hour window on my calendar where it was just like break for joy. And, and, and I, I could define joy in any way I wanted to in any given day. And sometimes it was like going for a jog through the woods. Sometimes it was one day we went out and found a waterfall. I jumped in it and <laughs> uh, you know went out for pizza, like whatever it is. Like I think finding those carving out time for joy yeah. is everything. And um, it often helps reduce, it helps nourish our soul, which helps us come back and give even more to our work. Even our best work, I think, comes from being in a place where you're full, not on E. Is there anything that you do in your morning routine that you feel sets you up for maybe a successful or a positive day? Um, yeah, I read a devotional every morning. Um, my devotional is uh, called Jesus Con- Calling, mm. and it is amazing. And everyone should have it, whether you believe, um, in Jesus Christ or God or not, whatever you call the higher power. I think, Mm. uh, this book is an amazing tool that just kind of has a way of shifting your perspective Mm. and putting you back into a place of gratitude. And, and, um, I think from that place, all good things flow. Mm -hmm. Final question. What does success mean or look like for you? Liberation. Mm. That's it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. OK. OK. I love That's that. It. Elaine, thank you so much. And we are definitely all checking thank out you. more than enough. Before we go, make sure to let everyone know how they can follow you and uh, keep up with your journey and where they can get the book. You can get the book anywhere. Books are sold um, online and in retail stores, um, Barnes and Noble, uh, Target, um, anywhere books are sold. And um, you can keep up with me on social media at Elaine Walteroth. And on Project Runway every week, every Thursday night at 9 p.m. on Bravo. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elaine. And as always, you guys, be good.